Chapter 45, The Dead Robots The gosling floated on the breeze beside his mother as she climbed down the cliffside. Down they went, past ledges and seagulls and tough little trees, until they were standing on the rocky shore with cliffs looming behind them. The gravesite had changed. Roz's crate was gone, lost to weather or waves. Some of the robot parts were gone too. Other parts were gritty with sand, or were tangled in seaweed, or were inhabited by small, scuttling creatures. One smashed torso still had a head and legs attached. Roz and Brightbill huddled around the corpse and studied the mess of tubes spilling out. "'This thing used to look like you?' said Brightbill. "'Yes, we are the same type of robot,' said Roz. "'And now this robot is dead?' In a way. Will you ever die, Mama? I think so. Will I die? All living things die eventually. Gosling's face scrunched with worry. Right, Bill? You are going to live a long and happy life. Roz laid a hand on her son's back. You should not worry about death. The gosling's face relaxed, and then he pointed to a small round shape on the back of the dead robot's head. What is that? he said. Roz leaned in closer. That is a button which is a knob on a piece of machinery that can be pressed to operate it. Brightbill began pressing the button. Click, click, click. Nothing is happening, he said. Probably because this robot is dead. Click, click, click. Mama, do you have a button? Bright Bill watched as his mother's head turned all the way around and a small button came into view. You've got one, he said. I never noticed it before. Neither did I, said the robot. The gosling giggled. Oh, Mama, you have so much to learn about yourself. Roz reached for the button on her head but her hand automatically stopped before she could touch it. She tried with her other hand, but it automatically stopped as well. It seems I cannot press the button, she said. Would you like to try? What will happen? I think I will shut down, but I think you could simply press the button again to restart me. You think? squawked Brightbill. What if you're wrong? What if you wake up different? What if you never wake up, Mama? I don't want to shut you down. Roz turned her head back around and saw that Bright Bill's face was once again scrunched with worry. She knelt beside him and said, Of course you do not have to do that to shut me down. I am sorry if I scared you. Are you okay? I'm okay. Bright Bill sniffled and wiped his eyes, and then he heard splashing. Otters were playing in the ocean. He had never seen otters before. He stared as they swam and dove and sloshed around with one another. They seemed to be having a ridiculous amount of fun, and suddenly the gosling was smiling again. Hello! My name is Brightbill, he shouted over the waves, and this is my mama. Her name is Roz. The last time those otters had seen Roz, they had thought that she was some kind of monster. But since then, they had heard that she was remarkably friendly and that she even adopted an orphaned gosling. And so the otters smiled at Roz and Brightbill. Then they swam straight over and splashed onto the rocks. Hello there, said the biggest otter. Nice to meet you both. Actually, Roz... We've met once before, but you might not remember me. My name's Shelly. I do remember you, said the robot, but I am glad to learn your name, Shelly. You know each other, said the gosling. These otters were the first animals I ever met, said Roz. They were also the first animals who ever ran away from me. Yeah, sorry about that said Shelly, as the other otters sniffed the robot's legs. You know, Bright Bill, when we first saw your mom, she was packed in a box and surrounded by soft, squishy stuff. Bright Bill's brow furrowed. 
You wouldn't believe how small she looked, all folded up in there. Bright Bill's nose sniffled. We thought she was dead, but when we reached into the box, she came to life and climbed out looking like a sparkling monster. Bright Bill's eyes welled up with tears, and then he felt his mother scoop him up into her arms. Are you okay? She whispered in his ears. I think I've learned enough about robots today, he whispered back. I am very sorry, otters, said Roz, but we really must be going. I hope I didn't upset the little guy, said Shelley. I thought he'd like to hear how we first met. Bright Bill will be fine, said Roz, using a friendly voice. But we have had a very busy day and we should go home. It was nice to see you again. Goodbye. Roz turned, and with her long stride, she carried her son away from the gravesite and over the base of the sea cliffs. Would you like to sit on my shoulder as I climb? said the robot. I feel like flying, said the gosling. I'll meet you at the top. Bright Bill flapped his wings and disappeared into the sky. Roz began scaling the wall. Up she went, expertly negotiating rocky columns and ledges until she hoisted herself onto the cliff top, where two young bears were waiting. Chapter 46 The Fight Hello, bears. My name is Roz. Oh, we know who you are, said the sister bear, her voice dripping with sarcasm. We're very happy to see you again. Yeah, we're very happy to see you again, echoed the brother bear. Why do you always repeat what I say, said the sister bear to her brother. It's so annoying. I was just backing you up. Let me do the talking. Fine. You don't have to be so mean about it. The bickering bears were interrupted by the robot's friendliest voice. With whom do I have the pleasure of speaking? How rude of us, said the sister bear. My name is Nettle, and this is my little brother, Thorn. I'm not little, snapped Thorn under his breath. It is lovely to meet you both, said Roz, but I am afraid I must really be going. And I'm afraid we can't let you do that, Nettle stepped into Roz's path. My brother and I, we don't like monsters. I am not a monster. I am a robot. Whatever you are, we don't like you, said Thorn. We hear you've become very comfortable on our island, said Nettle. Now, we're going to make you very uncomfortable. Yeah, we're going to make you very uncomfortable. Stop repeating me, Thorn. Poor Roz was in serious trouble. The bears were closing in on her, but she couldn't run. She couldn't hide, and she couldn't fight. The robot didn't know what to do. But before she could do anything, there was a loud squawk and a streak of feathers. Stay away from my mama! Bright Bill swooped down and skidded to a stop between the robot and the bears. So the rumors are true, Nettle laughed. <laughs> there really is a runty gosling who thinks the robot is his mother. How could anyone be so stupid? Do yourself a favor, gosling, and fly away before you get hurt. She's right, Bright Bill said Roz. Please let me handle this. But the gosling stood his ground and spread his wings and hopped around, ready to defend his mother. The bears roared with laughter. Then, with a flick of her paw, Nettle sent Bright Bill tumbling over the ground over and over until he flopped onto his back and stared up at the sky, stunned. This is our island, snarled Nettle. And it's time for you to go, growled Thorn. Roz made herself as big as possible. She banged her chest and roared wild, angry sounds, but the bears were not intimidated. They roared right back, 
and then they attacked. Nettle pulled Roz into a fierce bear hug while Thorn clawed at her legs. The robot tried to shake free, but the bears would not let go of their prey. Not this time. A cloud of dust bloomed around the trio as they thrashed closer to the edge of the cliff. All of a sudden, something burst out of the trees and onto the open cliff. Mother Bear. She was gigantic, like a mountain of golden fur, and she was furious. It seemed like this would be the end for our robot. But Mother Bear wasn't there to join the fight. She was there to break it up. Nettle, Thorn, get over here this instant! The young bears should have listened to their mother. Instead, they pretended not to hear her. Nettle slashed at Roz's body and Thorn began wrestling with her foot. He grabbed the foot with both paws and forced it up from the ground. Then, with every ounce of his strength, he twisted the foot around. Reader, the following events happened very quickly. First, there was a strange thwip sound as the robot's right foot popped off her leg and sailed through the air. Then everyone toppled over. Nettle and Roz fell sideways along the edge, but Thorn fell backward and tumbled right off the cliff. Do you know what the most terrible sound in the world is? It's the howl of a mother bear as she watches her cub tumble off a cliff. Mother Bear's howl was so startling that it snapped Bright Bill right out of his stupor. Her howl was so powerful that it shook Roz's entire body. Her howl was so loud that animals heard it clear across the island. But there was no reply from Thorn. Mother Bear's howl slowly faded, and she wilted to the ground. Roz watched as her detached foot sailed over the edge and plummeted down to the shore below. It fell past circling seagulls, smashed off a rock, and disappeared into the waves. And that's when the robot noticed something furry dangling from the cliffside. Thorn. His full weight hung from a tree that was rooted to the rock wall. He gripped the tree tightly in his jaws and looked up at Roz with wide, frightened eyes. I see Thorn, shouted Roz. Grab my legs, quickly. Mother Bear and Nettle scrambled to their feet. Each bear took a leg in her mouth, and together they slowly lowered Roz headfirst down the cliff. Thorn whimpered through clenched teeth as he watched the robot approach. Then he felt her strong arms wrap around him and heard her booming voice holler, Pull us up! Thorn let go of the branch and cried, Please don't drop me, Roz. I don't want to die. Do not worry, said the robot. I will not drop you. The next few moments seemed to drag on and on. Mother Bear and Nettle kept pulling on Roz's legs, and more of the robots slowly came into view until a furry golden head appeared, and Thorn leaped into the embrace of his family. Chapter 47, The Parade Does it hurt? Bright Bill touched the smooth surface where his mother's foot used to be. No, it does not hurt, said Roz but it will be difficult for me to walk. The bears huddled behind the gosling and stared at the robot stump of a leg. Nobody understood how a foot would pop off like that or how Roz could remain calm. Roz, I'm sorry my cubs attacked you, said Mother Bear. Sometimes they're completely out of control. It is okay. You know how they are at this age. I can't thank you enough for saving Thorn. I promise my cubs will never bother you again. Isn't that right? Yes, mother, said Nettle and Thorn together. The robot tried to walk. She bobbled up and down on her uneven legs, which worked well enough on the flat surface of the cliff tops. But once she entered the forest, her problem became clear. 
The smooth stump had no grip, and it slipped around on the forest floor. So Roz tried hopping on her one good foot. She took a few crunching hops and then clanged into a tree trunk. A few more hops and she crashed into the undergrowth. I am really sorry I broke off your foot, said Thorn as he helped the robot up from the weeds. I forgive you, said Roz. Whether she was capable of true forgiveness is anybody's guess. But they were nice words and Thorn felt better when he heard them. It looks like I will have to crawl home, said Roz. Nonsense, said Mother Bear. I have a better idea. Mother Bear lay flat on the ground while her cubs boosted Roz onto her back. Then Bright Bill fluttered onto the bear's broad shoulders. And when they were both safely aboard, the group set off through the forest. The robot was heavy, but she was no trouble for the giant animal. Mother Bear strolled along as if they were perfectly normal for a robot to be riding on her back. They made quite a grand procession, all walking together like that, and the procession became even grander as deer and raccoon and birds and all kinds of other animals joined in. Everyone wanted to see the mother robot riding the mother bear. The group wound its way past ancient trees and over rolling meadows and through babbling streams, collecting more and more curious animals as they went. It was the grandest parade of wildlife anyone had ever seen, and leading the way was our robot, Roz. But the parade couldn't last forever. As the sun went down, the other animals began drifting away one by one, and when the parade finally arrived at the nest, only the original members remained. Here we are said Mother Bear, helping Roz down into the garden. Now, wasn't that better than crawling all the way home? Oh, yes, that was wonderful, said the robot. I cannot imagine a better ending to this day. Thank you very much, very much. Yes, that was amazing, squeaked the gosling. My friends won't believe me when I tell them I rode across the island on the back of a bear. I'm glad you enjoyed yourselves, Mother Bear smiled. It's the least I can do after all the trouble these two caused. Her smile became a frown, and she glared at her cubs, who suddenly took great interest in the pebble on the ground. It was late, and it had been a long, difficult day for everyone, so the bears said goodbye and headed back to their cave. Bright Bill and Roz stood in the garden and watched their new friends lumber away, and then the gosling said, Mama, do you think you'll ever walk again? I am not sure, said the robot, but I know who to ask for help. Now get ready for bed. Chapter 48, The New Foot Mr. Beaver squinted at Roz's stump. I've never built a foot before, he stroked his whiskers and muttered to himself. There are really three problems to solve. The foot needs to grip the ground, and it needs to be durable. And then there's the issue of fixing it to the leg. I might have to consult a few friends. Will she ever be able to walk again? said Bright Bill. What's that? Mr. Beaver was lost in thought. Oh, don't worry. You just sit back and leave everything to me. I love a challenge. Mr. Beaver plunked into the pond and returned a while later, rolling a large section of tree trunk. Say hello to your new foot, he said, slapping the wood with his tail. Hello, new foot, said the robot. That's the spirit. This beauty is from one of the hardest trees I ever chewed. I just need to make a few modifications. Mr. Beaver placed the piece of wood next to Roz. He squinted, repositioned the piece, and squinted some more. With his claws, he marked different spots on the wood, and then he put his big chompers to work. The beaver chewed and gnawed and carved up that piece of wood, turning it over and over in his paws. Chit-Chat looked down from a branch and chattered through the quiet moments. 
This reminds me of the time I saw a fox catch a lizard by the tail and somehow the lizard's tail fell off and he got away and later I saw that the lizard got a new tail and now Roz is going to get a new foot and everything will be fine. The wooden foot took shape and before long, Mr. Beaver was standing next to a beautiful carving that resembled a boot. He tried to slide it over Roz's stump, but the opening was too small. So he scraped out more wood until it was a perfect fit. Very good, he said, spitting out a wood chip. My friends should be arriving any minute with the next few things we'll need. And there they are now. I'd like you to meet Bumpkin, Lumpkin, and Rumpkin, but I call them Fuzzy Bandits. Three fat raccoons shuffled into the garden, dragging a tangle of vines behind them. Good day, said Bumpkin. Good day, said Lumpkin. Good day, said Rumpkin. You might already know this, reader, but raccoons have very nimble hands, and the fuzzy bandits use theirs to skillfully tie those vines around the robot's leg and around her new foot. The vines caught nicely on all the dings and dents and scrapes. Once they were tied good and tight, Mr. Beaver threw back his head and hollered, Trunk tap! We could use your assistance! There was silence. And then three quick taps echoed down from the forest canopy. Ah, that'll be him, said Beaver, smiling. A very handsome woodpecker swooped into the garden. You called, came the woodpecker's musical voice. Indeed I did. Everyone, this is woodpecking pal Trunk Tap. Now, Trunky, we need some tree resin, that really sticky stuff. Can you help us out? Of course I can, said the woodpecker. You've got a perfect pine right here. Trunk Tap hopped over to a crusty old pine tree and pecked a few deep holes in the bark. Thick, syrupy resin began oozing down the trunk. Mr. Beaver scooped up handfuls of resin and smeared it all over the wooden foot and the vines until everything was glistening with stickiness. And when the resin dried and a short time later, Roz's foot was finished. This is wonderful, said the robot as she strolled around her garden. I am as good as new. Mr. Beaver and Trunk Tap and the Fuzzy Bandits went away feeling pretty happy with themselves. They had done a very nice thing, but it was the first wooden foot any of them had ever made. And within a week, the vines were coming undone and the foot was sliding loose. So they returned, determined to get it right. They found even harder wood and even tougher vines. They experimented with resin, heating it up by the fire, letting it boil and thicken until it became an indestructible glue. They kept tinkering with their design until finally Roz had herself a wooden foot that she could rely on. Huzzah! Mr. Beaver wrapped his knuckles on the new and improved creation. I knew we would get it right. Roz moved slower than before, and she had a slight limp, but she was back to her old self again, and that was a relief to everyone, especially Bright Bill. Chapter 49, The Flyer With coaching from everyone, Bright Bill was becoming a truly exceptional flyer. He wasn't the biggest or the strongest, but he was the smartest. You see, he and his mother had started studying the flying techniques of other birds, They'd sit for hours and watch how hawks and owls and sparrows and vultures move through the air. Then they'd go up to the grassy ridge and Bright Bill would practice what he'd learned. Soon he was diving and swooping and darting and soaring around the island. The adult geese frowned at his flying tricks, but the goslings thought he was amazing. Each morning a gaggle of them would wait on the water for Bright Bill to lead them into the sky, and then a few hours later he'd return home to Roz, shaking his tail feathers and honking about his latest airborne adventures. Mama, the other goslings didn't know that warm air rises so i found an updraft and we spent the afternoon circling around and around and hardly flapped our wings at all mama 
Did you see that lightning storm today? We knew there was going to be trouble when the wind started blowing from the north and we flew down to some shrubs and waited for the storm to pass. Mama, we just tried to fly in formation. We all took turns at the point, but everyone liked following me the best, so I led most of the time. Chapter 50, The Button Bright Bill was thinking about the small button on the back of his mother's head. His mother was thinking about it, too. They couldn't stop wondering what would happen if the button were pressed. And one day they decided it was time to find out. Ross sat on the floor of the nest. Her son nervously stood on the stone behind her. I am ready when you are, said the robot. Okay, said the gosling. Here we go. Brightbill took a deep breath. Click. Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet whirring slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. Mama, can you hear me? There was no answer. Brightbill waddled around and looked at his mother's face. Her strange spark of life had gone out. The gosling had never felt more alone. He was ready to switch her back on. But what if she didn't wake up? What if she woke up different? The gosling was afraid to press the button. And he was afraid not to press the button. Brightbill took a deep breath. Click. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet whirring slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Mama! Can you hear me? Hello, I am Rosam Unit 7134, but you can call me Roz. The robot spoke these words automatically in a language Brightbill didn't understand. His little heart raced as his worst fear seemed to be coming true. But a moment later, her familiar voice returned, and the robot said in the language of the animals, Hello, son. How long was I out? It seemed like it was only an instant to me. You were out only a few minutes, said the gosling as he hugged his mother. But it seemed like forever to me. Chapter 51, The Autumn The days were getting shorter, the air was getting crisper, and one morning Roz walked out to find a layer of frost on the garden. Autumn had come to the island. The tree leaves, which had been green for the robot's entire life, turned yellow and orange and red. Then they let go of their branches and floated down to the ground, and the forest gradually filled with the sounds of creatures scurrying through dead leaves. Tree nuts were also falling, thunking onto roots and rocks and occasionally clanging off the robot. The smell of flowers faded as the blossoms withered. All the rich scents and colors of the island were draining away. The animals were also changing. Furry animals were growing more fur. Feathery animals were growing more feathers. Scaly animals were starting to look for new homes. Yerp, it's cooling off, croaked one frog to another. Before long, it'll be time for sleeping. Yerp, I better start looking for a good hole, croaked a second frog. Have you found one yet? Nah croaked the first frog. I'll look for a hole next week. For now, I'm going to enjoy the warm sunlight while it lasts. Yerp. Many of the island animals were already thinking about their winter hibernation. Frogs, bees, snakes, and even bears would soon disappear and spend the next few months resting out of sight. And then there were the birds. Some birds, like owls and woodpeckers, would spend the winter nesting and eating the island's few remaining edibles. But the migratory birds were preparing for a long journey south to their warm wintering grounds. And among the birds destined to leave were the geese. Chapter 52, The Flock Bright Bill slowly waddled into the nest. He had a confused look on his face. Mama, the other goslings said that we have to leave the island soon and we won't return for months and months. Is that true? That is true, said Roz. You know that geese migrate south for the winter. 
Will you migrate with us? said Bright Bill. I cannot fly or swim, so I will spend the winter here on the island. Can I stay with you? I do not think that's a good idea. I think you should migrate with the flock. How long will my migration take? said Bright Bill. Where will we fly? When will we come home? I do not know, said Roz. Let us go ask the others. And so the robot and the gosling walked around the pond to where Loudwing and her friends were chatting. Hello, everyone, said Roz. Bright Bill has some questions about the flock's upcoming winter migration. And we would be happy to answer them, said Loudwing. What would you like to know, little one? How long will the migration take, said Bright Bill? Where will we fly? When will we come home? It will take us a couple of weeks to fly south, said Loudwing, depending on the weather. We'll join other flocks at a beautiful lake in the middle of a great sprawling field, said another goose. And we'll come back to the island after four or five months, said someone else, depending on the weather. As they walked back to the nest, Bright Bill said to his mother, Lately, I've been feeling the strong urge to fly, not just around the pond or the island, but to go on a long flight, a journey. Those are your instincts, said the robot. All animals have instincts. They help you to survive. Do you have instincts? said the gosling. I do have instincts. They help me to survive also. My instincts are definitely telling me to fly south for the winter, said Bright Bill. But I wish you could join us. I'm going to worry about you while I am away. Do not worry, I will be fine, said Roz. How bad could winter be? Chapter 53, The Migration It was the night before the migration and Bright Bill was sleeping fitfully. Roz watched him toss and turn until he finally crawled up into her arms and she rocked him to sleep, just like the old days. Early the next morning, Bright Bill waddled outside and looked at the pond. The water was perfectly still. A few lazy clouds drifted above. Geese were already gathering by the beach and then tiny claws scampering down from the treetops. So today's the day, huh? said Chit Chat, perched on a branch. So you're going to see so many new things and meet so many new animals. And if there are any squirrels at your wintering ground, please tell them that Chit Chat says hello. Today is the day, said Bright Bill. The flock will be leaving soon. Are you excited or nervous or scared? I'm all of those things, the squirrel whispered. Well, don't worry about your mother. I will look after her so you will know that she is perfectly fine. Bright Bill smiled. I am afraid it is time to go, said Roz as she stepped out of the nest. Okay, Mama, said Gosling. So see you in the spring, Chit Chat. Have a nice migration, Bright Bill. The squirrel scampered back into the treetops. Come home with lots of exciting stories, but not too exciting because I don't want anything scary to happen to you. Goodbye. The geese were honking with excitement and hustling around as they made their final preparations. Several of the fathers huddled together discussing their flight plans while the mothers took a head count. There you are, Bright Bill, Loudwing honked from the middle of the crowd. We're just about to begin. May I have your attention, please, said the biggest goose. As most of you know, my name is Longneck and I'll be leading this year's migration. I'm asking everyone to please join your families for takeoff. Once we've all been airborne, each family will take its position in our V formation, and we will start the first leg of our journey. Are there any questions? I have a question, came a booming voice. My son will not have his family with him. Where does he fit into the formation? Everyone turned to Long Neck. He can fly with me, said the big goose. I hear Bright Bill is a very clever flyer. I could use his help at the point. A moment later, the geese began flapping and honking and making their way into the air. A cloud of feathers floated down around the robot and her son. You are not a gosling anymore, said Roz. I am proud of the fine young goose you have become. Bright Bill fluttered up to his mother's shoulder. Thanks, Mama. The young goose wiped his eyes. Is this where we say goodbye? This is where we say goodbye for now. Spring will soon be here and we will be together soon. 
I'm going to miss you, said Bright Bill as he nuzzled his mother. I am going to miss you too, said Roz as she nuzzled her son. The goose took a deep breath, then he shook his tail feathers, flapped his wings, and joined the flock. At first, the geese flew in a disorganized jumble, but each goose slowly drifted into position until the flock formed a wobbly V. At the head was Long Neck, and behind his left wing was Bright Bill. They circled in the sky until the V pointed south, and then the geese began their long migration. Roz climbed to the top of a tree and watched as the flock slowly faded into the horizon. Chapter 54 The Winter The island was quiet. The migratory birds had all left. The hibernators were asleep, and everyone else had begun their simple winter routines. Everyone but Roz. Now that she was alone, our robot didn't know what to do with herself. She stood in her gray garden and watched a sheet of ice slowly form on the pond. Sometimes she could hear her good friends, the beavers, going about their business beneath the ice, and she wondered when she would see them again. Ross stood there until snowflakes started drifting down from the sky. The flakes swirled in the breeze and slowly piled on the ground and on the trees and on the robot. So she crouched into the nest slid the stone door behind her and sat in darkness. Hours and days and weeks went by without the robot moving. She had no need to move. She felt perfectly safe in the nest. And so, in her own way, the robot hibernated. Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet whirring slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. She probably could have spent centuries like that, hibernating in total darkness. But the robot's hibernation was suddenly interrupted when a shaft of sunlight fell upon her face and carried energy back into her empty battery. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet whirring slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Hello, I am Roz, I'm Unit 7134, but you can call me Roz, the robot said automatically. When all her systems were up and running again, Roz noticed that she was surrounded by broken branches and piles of snow. The roof of the nest had caved in, and the lodge was now flooded with sunlight. Roz felt more energized with each passing minute, but she also felt cold. Her joints felt stiff and brittle, and her thinking was slow. So she got up, cleared a spot on the floor, and made a fire. The snow inside the nest began to melt, and the robot's sensors began to thaw. And when she was ready, she climbed out through the hole in the roof and into the bright foreign landscape. The world Roz had known was now covered in a thick layer of snow. Tree limbs bent to the ground under heavy sleeves. The dark pond was now pure white. The only sounds were Roz's own crunching footsteps. Faint wisps of steam curled up from the robot's body as she trudged through the forest. Roz plunged a hand into a lump of snow and pulled up a long stick. She snapped it in half and flung both pieces back to the nest. She took a few more steps and picked up a fallen tree. She hacked it into smaller pieces and flung them back as well. Then she reached down to another snowy shape, but what she pulled up was not a piece of wood. It was Dart the Weasel. He was frozen solid. Ross stared at his stiff body for a moment, then decided it was best to leave the poor thing where it was. As the robot continued gathering wood, she found more victims of the cold. A frozen mouse, a frozen bird, a frozen deer. Had all the island animals frozen to death? No, not at all. There were fresh tracks in the snow. As we know, the wilderness is filled with beauty, but it is also filled with ugliness, and that winter was ugly. A devastatingly cold front had swept down from the north and brought dangerous temperatures and huge amounts of snow. The animals had prepared for winter, but nothing could have prepared for the weaker ones for those long nights when the temperatures plummeted and the wind whipped over the island. Roz returned to the nest where the fire had melted the interior snow to a muddy soup. She took a minute to warm her body by the flames. 
and then she began the repairs. She patched up the hole in the dome with lattice of branches before adding a layer of mud and leaves, and soon the repairs were complete. But another snowfall might cave the nest all over again, so Roz decided to keep a fire going day and night to prevent snow from building up on the roof. The robot brought in load after load of firewood, and each time she went outside, she was reminded of the frozen weasel and mouse and bird and deer. How many other frozen animals were hidden beneath the snow? Before going in for the night, she called out to whoever was listening, Animals of the island, you do not have to freeze. Join me in my lodge, where it is safe and warm, 